Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to the Monday, September 30th edition of The Gun Show. I'm your host, Dave Womack, from theprepperproject.com. Now, we've all prepared for the end of the world as we know it, but have you read the book on how to prepare for the end of the world as we know it? In fact, today we're talking with author James Wesley Rawls, founder of survivalblog.com, and he has some amazing things to talk to us about today, and I can't wait to get his thoughts, some input, and definitely some practical, tactical prepping tips. But first, a word from our sponsors. Ceramic body armor is rated to stop six hits. But what about the seventh? Unlike ceramic or Kevlar, Infidel body armor is proven to take hit after hit, and it just won't quit. Reasonably priced and designed for the smart civilian prepper, Infidel stops hundreds of hits from small arms to high-powered rifles. That means safety and peace of mind. Buy yours at InfidelBodyArmor.com, spelled I-N-F-I-D-E-L BodyArmor.com. Infidel body armor just won't quit. All right, and as always, we are a listener-supported show, so please definitely check out those sponsors and give them a, a little bit of attention. Say you were sent over from the prepperproject.com or right here at prepperbroadcasting.com. Well, on today's show, we've got really an amazing guest. Uh, he was influential in me actually being to the point where I am now with my preps and being able to have this show to help everybody out. And and it was really something that I think is his long-term goal, and maybe his call in life, is to really get people motivated to prepare. And this is on any sort of budget. I can tell you I've been reading survivalblog.com since my days on Ringling Brothers, and uh, it's really what kind of woke me up. And, and he's got a fantastic blog. Highly suggest checking it out. Um, but without any further ado, uh, James Wesley Rawls, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on. Hey, now I gotta ask. Uh, do you prefer to go by James or, or what? Oh, just what, by Jim is fine. Just by Jim. All right, uh, Jim. I, I didn't mention in your intro there that you're a New York Times best-selling author with two books, um, and uh, a very huge feat, especially in a niche that is uh, really up for debate potentially. You know, people people think, oh, you're into doomsday, or they think you're anti-establishment, uh, or you know, against the president by reading these types of books or writing these types of books. And so to make it a New York Times best-selling author, um, especially in this category, I mean, that's got to be no easy feat. Can you, can you give us a little background about, um, first of all, I guess, who you are, your background in the military, and, um, and, and how recently you, are, uh, you, know, you left the military? Sure. Um, I was a captain in Army Intelligence. I was, um, to be technical, I was a 35 Alpha 5 Mike which means wow. I was a tactical all-source intelligence officer with a specialty in electronic warfare. Uh, I primarily worked in the signals intelligence arena. Most of my time was in actually the Army Reserve rather than the active Army, but I did get a chance to work several real-world live missions uh, in intelligence. I actually left the Army after my contractual obligation ended after six years of service and uh, that was the day after Bill Clinton was sworn into office. I didn't <laughs> like the idea of him being my commander-in-chief so I took the option to go ahead and, and leave the service. Smart man, smart man. In fact that's actually when I started buying guns was the day after Obama took office um, and I haven't stopped so <laughs> but I'm with you on the on the idea of, you know, really follow what your heart and your, your passion's telling you to do when you see leadership not potentially going the way that you think is, is best for our nation. Uh, I, I definitely commend you for that because um, that, that takes a lot to have to make that life choice, that life change at a point where maybe the income's looking really good. Um, so I guess at what point did you sit down to write your first book? Because uh, and we'll, we'll jump into some of this here in a moment, but... You... Sure. I, I, I wrote uh, my first novel, which was um, originally going to be titled Triple Ought, because uh, it was going to be about Y2K, of all things. Um, mm -hmm. And that was in the winter of 1990-1991. Wow. And um, that was when I'd first moved to Idaho, and when I was busy pounding nails, uh, building a house, uh, on a 40-acre place outside of Orofino, Idaho. Now, back in 1990, 1991, not a lot of people were really talking economic collapse. 
uh, it was a fairly weak economy at the time, but to talk about uh, mass inflation, hyperinflation even, was considered kind of outlandish. The book was originally distributed as shareware on the Internet back in the early days of the Internet in the mid-1990s, and it achieved a lot of success. I had over 72,000 people download the book, and this was in the days when probably less than 3 or 4% of the population of the United States had, it was on the Internet, and when most people had never even heard of the Internet, uh, it was uh, very much the nascent days of the Internet, and be really before the World Wide Web even took off. Very cool. Well, and, and I have to tell you a little bit of my backstory. Um, I'm, a, I'm a professional entertainer. I started out as a magician, an illusionist, touring around uh, just my local area doing, you know, my bird act. And then I grew up doing competitions and winning some gold medals with, with my magic acts where I incorporated birds. We had some success overseas, my wife and I, um, traveling around, particularly Asia. And I got to see the, the extreme wealth and the extreme poverty of Bangladesh. Uh, in, in Bangladesh, there is literally people, you know, maimed people riding around on skateboards or using a skateboard to push themselves around while other people drove around with Mercedes that were pimped out with diamonds all over it. Uh, and this is no joke. Um, I sat in my hotel room and I looked out at a pile of garbage and realized that the tarp sticking out of the pile of garbage was somebody's home. And it kind of woke me up a little bit to the realization of, you know, where did the middle class go? I was there to film a TV show for Magic. And I, I realized that there was no middle class here. So it made me start to think, why? Um, shortly after that, I got uh, hired by Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey to go tour around with them as a headlining position for two years on their show. Well, I was forced into living a very uh, prepper lifestyle, if you will. I lived out of an RV um, for two years. So, you know, the, the, the famous last words where it's not like we put you on the tour and you're on your own, um, but that's exactly what happened. We did the tour. We didn't go as this whole convoy going down, you know, the interstate we were simply every act for themselves. We'd get there, we'd set up the show, but I learned how to cook on propane. Um, I learned how important a generator was. And I kind of learned these self-reliant skills. Then my brother, my brother was trying to tell me, you know, get a bunch of food, keep up a year's worth of food, buy some silver. And I just thought he was nuts. I didn't understand. And so I immediately realized that nobody else understands this. So I bought I bought two books. The first book I bought was Rich Dad Poor Dad's Investing in Gold and Silver. And what that book opened my eyes to is that this facade of an economy is just that. It's surreal. It's, it's very fake. It's fabricated. And our dollar's worth nothing. And so mm -hmm. uh, with some coaxing, my brother told me to put $1,000 towards silver. Once he had got me over that little hurdle, then he told me to read your book. Uh, and the book that I'm referring to is Patriot's. Surviving the Coming Collapse. And I have to tell you about the audio version as well as several versions of the, the paperback. Um, I have listened to that audio book more times than I really care to admit. Because every time I listen to it, I learn something new. And you, you really woke me up. And, you know, since then, I, I've really, you know, I've, I've stockpiled a lot of things. More importantly, I've got tactical training um, and I wanted to have a platform where I could reach out to other people to help push them into being motivated to prepare. And so that's really where you came in. And your book, Patriots, uh, it, it helped me a ton. And it gave real-life scenarios of what I think somebody could expect. Uh, Long-winded story to get to the, the question, but I guess with the book, Patriots, did you, what was your goal with that? Was it to try to get people to start preparing and just to think outside yes, the it, box? Yes, uh, definitely. I, I originally was thinking about writing a survival manual, and then I thought of all the things that needed to be included in it, and I realized it was going to be at least 250 pages long. And I came to the realization that most people will not sit down and read a full-length nonfiction book. But a lot of people will sit down and read a novel. So I decided to basically create a survival manual dressed as fiction. So most people end up reading my book through a couple of times or more than that. 
but the first time through for fun because it's a bit of a roller coaster ride. And the second time through with a yellow highlighting pen and a notepad in their hand, taking <laughs> notes. And uh, if that happens, I consider it a, a success. Yeah, you know, and, and beyond that too, I mean, I, I fall right into that category. Uh, beyond what you're saying about that, you know, I've used your book to help wake people up. I've given it out to mm -hmm. to probably a half dozen people where I'll just go buy some extra copies because it's really just a, a great tool and a, and a fantastic read. I'm not trying to just uh, to, to plug products here, but, um, you know, I downloaded it off of Audible and I thought the guy doing the voiceovers, by the way, um, was fantastic. I really, really enjoyed the voiceover that was done for the book, but I learned something every single time. And then I ended up discovering you had another book called How to Survive the End of the World as We Know It. How to Survive Tiatwaki, as, as everybody is uh, is starting to call it. Now, I have to ask, did you did you coin that term? No, I didn't. Uh, the term Tiatwaki was invented in the early days of the Internet by, by a guy on miscellaneous.survivalism by the name of Mike Medintz. That's M-E-D-I-N-T-Z. And he deserves full credit for having created that acronym. Yes, with uh, How to Survive the End of the World as We Know It, I basically, at, at, that was uh, published uh, around 2008, 2009. I'd already been uh, producing Survival Blog on a daily basis since September of 2005. I just uh, took some of the very best posts from the blog and uh, put those into book form along with some extra commentary. And the book really wrote itself. One of the nice things about blogging is that you're generating so, so many written words every day that if you're not publishing books out of it, you're foolish. Uh, it's, it's really a book writing machine. And I really appreciate all the knowledge that was shared by the readers of my blog. The, the knowledge that went into that book goes far beyond my own. Uh, there are some really amazing people that read Survival Blog, uh, several emergency room doctors, uh, a lot of people in the Special Forces community, um, all sorts of uh, people with really unusual professions like underwater welders, for goodness sake. Mm. All, all kinds of interesting folks contributed to that book and are continuing to contribute to Survival Blog. And for any of your listeners, uh, even those who don't want to, to, to buy my books, that's fine. Just please take full advantage of all the free resources that are available at survivalblog.com. It's all fully indexed. It's fully searchable. And the real kicker is it's all free. There's no super secret members only password required area. The entire blog archives, which again, date back to 2005, and if, were, if it were all put into the form of a book, would be over 9,000 pages. Wow. It's all available free. Wow. And, and I was actually just going to say, I'm sitting on your website right now as we look at this, and I've, the part that blows me away is when I st first started coming to your website, um, you obviously had a lot of traffic, but your visitor map wasn't quite as, as overwhelmed as it is now, but I'm looking at this great little graphic you have here, and you've got people that are literally every single corner of the globe except possibly part of China that oh, have... Well, and Antarctica is not very well represented <laughs> either. But... Not, not yet, but you do have some <laughs> representation there. <laughs> uh, but, but I really you've got to form an lot. expedition to get better representation. Huh? <laughs> yeah, but, but you've been getting a ton of traffic, um, and the fact that it's free and it's really great advice. And the other thing that I think really appealed to me, especially in the beginning and I know this will appeal to all of our listeners, is it's for a budget-conscious prepper. A lot of these things, okay, yeah, you can go out and you can buy the $3,000 PVS-14 night vision. You can go, but as many of you know, it's more about the knowledge than the stuff, and you really do a fantastic job of laying out all of the knowledge there. Um, and, and you kind of bypass all the scare tactics that all of the other websites have. Um, and you just go straight to, here's some how-to um, and, and really things that I think people would enjoy. What's the, um, what's like the number one article that maybe gets shared the most or you've got the most feedback on over at survivalblog.com? Oh, boy. That's, that's really hard to say. I, I've never really fully quantified it. Um, 
I maybe think a topic. By that... categories, if you look at the ones that are the most popular, I think the ones on food storage and water filtration are the most popular. And I think that's simply because those two forms of preparation pretty well cross the line, no matter whether you're preparing for a nuclear war or, uh, or a pandemic or an economic collapse or a solar flare or whatever, you need to have those squared away. And uh, those, those articles are perennial favorites. Mm. And there's a lot of information in the blog that uh, is quite detailed about how to, how to do food storage uh, on a budget, how to do it yourself using five-gallon food-grade plastic buckets that you can literally get free if you ask around. If you go to bakeries and delicatessens, they often give away uh, food-grade buckets or will sell them to you for just a buck a piece. Uh, yeah. There's a number of methods that I describe both in my book and in my blog about how to use those to do your own food storage. Well, and that's and the kind of food storage that gets used the most. Uh, a mistake that a lot of people make is they buy a commercially packaged storage food system, but it includes foods that they don't use on a regular basis. Yeah. And those foods tend to just sit around and not get used. If people package the staple foods that they use on a regular basis, they're, those are the foods that are going to get consumed regularly, and there you're going to be rotating your stocks, and you're never going to be faced with the situation of having to throw food out feed it to the pigs, or donate it to the food bank. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, I just had a big garage sale down in Florida. Um, I'm originally from the Pacific Northwest. I grew up in Spokane. And um, and my wife grew up in Sandpoint. So we spent a lot of time in, in those areas. My career had taken me around the world. And literally after reading your book, it was like, oh, man, what am I doing? I need to get out of Florida. And so it's taken some time. But, um, but, but thanks to a push largely by you and the American readout and just kind of where you've decided where, where people should really live. And I know that it's, you know, probably not just you, but, uh, you've, you've helped really illustrate in a lot of different ways where the safest part of America is. And I knew that I needed to, to be there. Um, but back to the food stores, you know, I, I had a food rotation system, um, through shelf reliance and it's mm -hmm. a great system. It's oh, you put in, yes. you put in a can and, the first one in is, is the first one out, so you never have old cans stuck at the back. Well, for my move, I couldn't fit all the canned food, so I ended up sending it, uh, you know, selling it off. But, uh, but I was able to help some people, and when I was selling it, I realized that some of that food was even going to expire in the next month or so. Um, so, you know, and those were the items that I didn't use a lot. So I think your tip there is, is fantastic. Um, Let's, let's talk a little bit more about what you see happening. A lot of people are preparing for different things, as you mentioned. What is well, right your now thought? I'm, I'm, I'm concentrating on three different scenarios. Um, first and foremost is economic collapse, because we're, we're virtually on, uh, uh, on the verge of it right now. Uh, right now, the Federal Reserve and the Treasury are doing their very best to reinflate a bubble that shouldn't be reinflated. They're spending $85 billion a month well, they're not really even spending it. They're creating it, which means they're dilute, diluting the value of the U.S. money supply to the tune of $85 billion a month with quantitative easing. Jeez. And what they're buying up with that $85 billion is treasury paper and mortgage-backed securities, which are a form of derivative. And it was mm -hmm. derivatives, that, uh, specifically in mortgage area, that got us in this trouble in the first place in 2008. So yeah. they're essentially trying to rebuild, reinflate a bubble uh, that should have popped. They didn't let it pop. And when it does finally pop, it's going to be ad absolutely catastrophic. It's going to be huge compared to 2008. It will topple uh, entire national governments before it's all done. Not, ju not just currencies will fall, but entire governments will fall when this happens. Can you give me an example? So that's the, the, Go ahead. I know you've got two other uh, two other things you're preparing for, um, but but before we jump into the other two, can you give me an example of how other governments would fall? You know, I think that's a really broad idea for people, a really out out there concept. Um, but obviously, it's it's backed up with research. I mean, can you give me an example of of how a national government would fall through our dollar failing? Uh, well, sure. Um, if 
if you look at some of the marginal economies of the world, and there's lots of them, uh, these are countries that have a gross domestic product that is smaller than most American states. And when the U.S. dollar uh, catches cold, uh, the economies of these countries are going to get double pneumonia. There's so many countries that are dependent upon the export of just one, two, or three key resources from a country, whether they're extracted by mining, by fishing, by farming, or in, in created with technology, um, these are very fragile economies. And when their main trading partner disappears, absolute chaos ensues. That makes total sense. Thank you for, for clarifying that for some of the people out there. Um, okay, so you mentioned economic collapse. Ooh. Yeah, I think that's top of my list. I guess next down the list would probably be a solar flare. And right now we're, as I'm sure you know, the solar cycle is an 11-year cycle. We're at, uh, approaching the maximum of that cycle, but we're in a very strange situation where the sunspot numbers have been very low. So what we're coming into is a solar maximum, but a weak maximum. And if you look historically at when the worst X-class solar flares have occurred, they've occurred during a weak maximum. And that's when the Carrington event occurred, for example, in the 1850s. Yeah. And that one was huge. And luckily, we were in a, in a still a pre-electronic and early electrical infrastructure society at the time. So, yeah, it, uh, it set a lot of telegraph stations on fire. Uh, but otherwise, it didn't cause a lot of other damage. It was just kind of a curiosity. If that same event were to happen today, we would see the all three of the national power grids in the United States be absolutely decimated. And virtually every major transformer up and line, down the line would be destroyed. And unfortunately, we have very few spare transformers for our power substations and uh, the major distribution network. Now, why uh, do you think the, the government isn't hardening our structures to be protected against EMP? Because they're solar very short-sighted. Uh, they actually could be instituting safeguards right now that would isolate huge chunks of the grid very quickly uh, through switching. I mean, it's, it's not rocket science, and it doesn't require really new technologies. What it requires is some automated switching that would allow physical disconnection of these transformers on short notice. So, because essentially all those miles and miles of high tension lines and power distribution lines are antennas for EMP. Oh, jeez. <laughs> they, and uh, they have long distance coupling of EMP or the, the, a very similar waveform coming out of uh, solar flares. So all they really need to have is switching and disconnect so that when the solar flare does occur, and we actually have uh, quite a bit of notice, quite a bit of warning, because we can see the solar flares erupting on the surface of the sun. We can do the math, and we can know exactly when we need to disconnect. I would much rather see a short-term power failure than a, a destruction of the power grid, which could wipe out the grid for months or years or you know, maybe decades. Unfortunately, Congress has been very short-sighted. They haven't funded this. And even though it would probably be the equivalent of about 20% of the national military budget for the year in just one shot, yeah, they haven't funded it. I heard something to the tune of short-sighted. Someday we're going to horribly regret it. Yeah, and I heard something to the tune of about three hundred million to harden or you know safeguard the entire nation's uh, right. Yeah, there's system. a wonderful organization called Impact America. It's E M P A C T America dot org, and uh, it was uh, started by an industrial magnate who wanted to encourage people to lobby Congress to go ahead and set up uh, these protections. And uh, I highly recommend that your listeners check out that organization and get involved. 
perfect. We're, we're going to do a video broadcast of uh, kind of a slideshow of this whole interview here. So I'll put that up on the screen so people can see uh, in the video broadcast of this as well. Um, okay, so the, the third thing, you've got economic collapse, solar flare. What's the third scenario that you think is most likely? That is pandemic. Mm. Uh, that's always a wild card. We never know when it's going to happen. Uh, but we live in a society now that is uh, very much interdependent, connected, and in constant transport. So today we are faced with the prospect that if we do have a high lethality influenza pandemic, it could spread around the world within just a few days. It won't take months like, like uh, traditional pandemics have. And uh, the ability to react to that is going to be very, very brief. And I frankly think that we're going to see massive loss of life the next time we do have a major pandemic, if it is uh, highly contagious and with a high lethality rate. So I have to ask then, I, I, I have to imagine that location is key for really protecting yourself and your family against all three of those. I mentioned the redoubt. Mm -hmm. uh, would you agree that that would help safeguard everybody, or if you will, yes, just kind of explain what that case, is? Yes, although in the case, there's a couple of different types of pandemics. There are some that are spread by casual contact and some that are spread on the wind. Uh, you can be in the safest place in the world if, if a, if a, uh, mu if a um, mutated uh, virus or bacteria is spread on the wind, that's going to catch you just about anywhere you are. But for any other situation, I think that a area like the American Redoubt is a very wise choice because here you've got a very light population density. You're isolated from all the major population centers and uh, you've got a fairly diverse economy with quite a bit of agriculture, all the timber you could ever want in the world. You can, you can burn firewood for the rest of your life and then some. Yeah, And uh, also, quite importantly, it's a hydroelectric exporting region. I'm talking to you from a place that's within 50 miles of two major hydroelectric dams. We make so mm. much power here, it's astounding. Yeah, And it gets exported. And as I explained in my blog, I wrote an uh, article entitled Islands in the Darkness, and it talked about how a lot of the electrical power co-ops and uh, local power utilities are set up already. They've, they've made contingency plans and they have the systems in place to automatically disconnect themselves from the national power grid and reconstitute locally. And the, in, the, in the industry, they refer to that as islanding. They create an island of power in the overall darkness of a grid collapse. And they can do that literally at the flip of the switch. Um, I had a conversation with uh, some folks with a power utility in Farmington, New Mexico, when I was there to research, uh, doing the background for my novel, uh, Survivors. And the folks at the power utility said, oh yeah, we're set up for islanding. Here they were in the Four Corners region of New Mexico, where they produce a tremendous amount of natural gas. Uh, they have uh, both natural gas and hydroelectric power and their system was automatically set up that if the national grid went down, their power would come back on within five seconds. Very cool. And that was for like a hundred mile radius. So that's the kind of area where people should be living. And, and that's what we have here in the inland Northwest. I've heard you mention before, it's about a five state region. Can you explain where that is specifically? Sure. Uh, the, the American Redoubt consists of Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, and the eastern half of Oregon and the eastern half of Washington. Uh, that's the area that I think is probably going to be the most survivable because of its population density and because of its isolation from major population centers. Now, is this some uh, uh, term that you coined? Yes. And, and literally, too, I think I've seen uh, silver silver coins now that you, people can buy for... Um, uh, yeah, for, yeah, they do make the American preparing. Readout coin. In fact, that's, there's an, another company uh, that's getting uh, tooled up to make them as well. That's great. That's awesome. 
Um, switching a little bit of the topic here, on your website, you, uh, you, you obviously have a great amount of just a huge wealth of information at survivalblog.com, but I know you've safeguarded your website in a way so that if the Americans decide to shut down the internet, your site will still be up. Can you talk a little bit about how that works? Well, yeah, and we actually doing have, it? have three different servers, and I'd rather not go into the details of where they are, but I can mention that one of them is in Sweden, and we are set up for kind of automatic failover. Uh, we will also very widely uh, publish the dotted quad IP address for our website so that even if um, the U.S. government were to hijack the domain name of survivalblog.com, there's no way that they could stop the signal. Uh, we could st people can still log on using that dot quad address, and it would go to one of our overseas servers, so there'd be essentially no interruption of service. Uh, it, it might take a few days for the news to spread for people who only had survivalblog.com bookmarked, but I recommend that people bookmark not just survivalblog.com, but also our dotted quad address, which we very prominently put in the upper left-hand corner of my blog page. And I was going to say, I've got it here. It's 95.143.193.148. And that's been, uh, I've actually been to your site when it had been, um, I don't know if it was hacked or, or infiltrated. Yeah, we've had two different major hack attacks in the last two years. So I, I, I guess that's just a sign of our success. Uh, right, and I've been able to still see your like site. Success like that uh, is going to attract the attention of, of malicious hackers. Absolutely. Um, let's look at the top overlooked items that that preppers seem to forget about. Um, do you have kind of an idea of of what most people glaze over in the process of buying guns and ammo? Yeah, I think that one of the most important is night vision equipment. Uh, there's people have elaborate gun collections, thousands of rounds of ammunition, spare parts, magazines, web gear for all their guns. But then you ask them what kind of night vision gear they have, and they say, oh, well, I haven't gotten around to that. Yeah. I would much rather have a few really good, reliable guns with night vision gear on at least two of them rather than have a large gun collection. Because essentially, without night vision gear, you're blind at night. It's not, you're not going to be tactically effective. Yes, there yeah. are some workarounds like setting up trip flares or having um, um, trip uh, chemical light sticks, for example, and you can get those. And yeah. you can also get a lit reticle scope like a trijicon scope. But that's not near as good as having uh, good quality light amplification night vision equipment. And for that, I, but the scope that I recommend the, bet, the most is a ANPVS-14, which is a night vision monocular. And you can use that handheld. You can mount it on your helmet. Or you, you can put it on a weapons mount. And you, you would line that up uh, coaxially where you're looking through a, something like a, a, uh, an aim point scope uh, or uh, one of the Bushnell scopes, for example, with a, a, uh, a, a lit reticle that you can dial way, way down because a standard lit reticle is way too bright if you're looking at it through a starlight scope. Yeah. It'll blind you. And I want to echo that a little bit too. My, my brother and I had actually purchased, I'll leave the amount of purchases uh, <laughs> off the table here, but we had purchased some PVS 14s after reading your book and, and hearing your different uh, interviews. And then we took it a step further because we realized that a lot of preppers have the stuff and they've never used it in a, right. in a scenario like they would have to face. In fact, I'd yeah, like to send to go you... People go out and, and, and do a little Batman in the boondocks. You need to go out and play with this stuff and um, you know just make absolutely sure that your weapons are completely unloaded. You're not carrying any live ammunition. And go do some sneaking and creeping. And... Uh, you know, play a little, um, uh, you know, and you're out in your backwoods, get used to uh, using night vision gear, recognize the effect of moonlight in particular. Yeah. Uh, because there's nights where you have literally nothing but starlight on, if you're at, at, a, at a night of a new moon. And with a good quality starlight scope, unless you're under tree cover, 
you're still going to be able to operate where everybody else can't even see the hand in front of their face. Yeah, you know, and, and after reading your book and buying the equipment, we ended up hiring an ex-Army uh, lieutenant to, to basically come train us. We did this a few times, and we ended up doing a DVD with him. Uh, it's called Own the Night. Uh, a lot of our guys can get that over at theprepperproject.com slash tactical-training. Um, and it, I'd like to send you a copy if you're interested in it. It was something that sure, was... I'd be happy to. It was really fun to be able to see how bad we were. And we included this all in the DVD. You know, we're just average guys. Um, we're good shots. We shoot a lot. We train a lot. But we hadn't done night vision before. And so over three days, you see us literally fumbling over our feet to performing tactical assaults. And, and, uh, and it all started with literally going out and playing laser tag and realizing the strengths and weaknesses of the night vision. And we, like you said, mm -hmm. we'd empty all the weapons. We'd have... Uh, you know, we'd put on the visible laser and we'd go try to find each other. And, you know, you'd, you'd hit the other person with a laser, uh, you know, obviously making sure all safety precautions were in place. But it, it was jaw dropping to realize how not bulletproof you are with it unless you know how to use it properly. Right. As, as we used to say in the Army, there's a steep learning curve. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. You, I'm glad to see that you have overcome that. A lot of people haven't. And if, uh, if people take the time to practice with their gear, they can really become proficient with it. And it's only when you're fully proficient that you're going to have a, a true advantage over your opponents. It, that only comes with time. It only comes with practice. And, and that same principle applies to gardening, of all things. You really need to practice getting a, a garden in every year. You need to learn which crop varieties do well in your particular climate zone. You need to practice saving seed. There's, you, you, there's a, so much that goes on uh, with getting proficient. But once I, you I have chuckled. that level of proficiency, it's between your ears. No one can take that away from you. Yeah. And I, I chuckle a little bit when you say, you know, learn to garden because that's one of the things that I think personally most people overlook. And um, we really try to, to plug that at our website, which is interesting because we're plugging gardening and then tactical training and, and mm -hmm. kind of in a, I don't know, in a political charged world. Um, but somehow it works. But my brother decided to do a permaculture garden, which oh, we've been neat. posting okay. about. And it's really, really cool. We're basically, for those, those out there that don't know... Uh, essentially, you're creating a forest that produces food and feeds itself. Um, the chickens turn the soil and they eat the seeds and the, the fruit from trees that drop that are planted you know, specifically for them. And the water catchment overflows into the orchard and it drains properly downhill. It's just huge, huge thing. Well, I've always had this philosophy of hurry up and fail because you never get it right the first time. So exactly. my goal in life is to hurry up, do it the first time so I can get that learning curve out of the way and then go do it right. And my brother, he planted 250, uh, had a corn and, and he had one, one piece of corn make it out of all of that, you know, and, and this is from somebody who studies it all the time, researches it, and then goes out and applies it. And, uh, there's really it's way harder than people think. You can't just go throw some seeds in the ground and expect to have a you know big Thanksgiving feast 11 months later. It's, right. uh, it's something, obviously, you got to practice now and, and just start it small and try to make it bigger. But Yeah, the, the, the same kind of principle applies to everything from how to, how to use a wood stove and, and cook on it and uh, how to operate a, a piece of machinery. It, it, it's the same principle that applies. I've often been quoted as saying that owning a gun doesn't make anyone a shooter any more than owning a surfboard makes someone a surfer. You really so need true. to practice. You really need to be innately familiar with that particular gun. You need to be able to handle its controls in pitch dark. That's yeah, the level that... of, of familiarity you need to have to be really functional and, it makes and a lot really of... prevail. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And one of the things that I always try to preach to, to our people, you know, I'm a huge found, uh, fan of the AR-15 platform. Um, like any weapon, it has advantages and disadvantages. And I'm, you know, but I like that it's available in 22 long rifle. I like that it's available in 223 or 556. 
It's available in the, the 308 calibers. It's available in a 458 caliber. Um, and it's available as a BB gun. I mean, but I've purchased all of mine in that particular realm because it doesn't matter which weapon I pick up. They all function identically. Right. Your, all your controls are in the same place. And I, and I ended up... You have to develop what's called muscle memory. And so... Uh, and that's it's muscle memory that you will you will revert to under pressure. Yeah. So you got to be really careful about the way you train because you're going to fight the way you train. Okay. And if you're used to uh, doing magazine changing drills where you just pull the trigger once, you may find yourself accidentally in combat swapping magazines without even realizing it. Uh, so you've got to really train the way you're going to fight. How would you and should you suggest will fight the way you train? Yeah, and how would you suggest people train under pressure? Because that was something when we filmed Own the Night where it was like, you know, just just painfully obvious how bad we would have, you know, just been annihilated in a first firefight. Um, how well, would the average the person train? Yeah, all the trainers at the major schools like Front Sight and Gun Sight and Thunder Ranch always say, and they're right, under stress, you are going to revert to your basic level of training. You're not going to rise to the occasion and become some super soldier <laughs> right. because you're under stress. You're actually going to revert to your base level of training. So that base level of training, it better be pretty solid. That makes a lot of sense. We're actually headed down to front site. Uh, my brother's been there several times and, and uh, he bought me a lifetime membership. So I'm headed down there uh, not too long from now to get a little bit extra training. So yeah, good advice for everybody out there. Let me ask... Um, Time frame. If you and this is a tough one, obviously, because nobody can predict it. But yes, you're you're a smart guy. <laughs> yeah. When is it going to collapse? Yesterday? Okay. <laughs> you need to be prepared. Yesterday. Uh, the uh, no. I, I seriously, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't pretend to. Uh, all I can say is, because of the complexity of our society increasing with every passing day, and because of the economic issues that I mentioned previously we are closer now to societal collapse than we ever have been before. Yeah. And it's in everyone's best interest to pray about this, set a budget and get serious about preparedness because time is relatively short. It's time to sell your jet ski. It's time to sell your 62 inch HD TV plasma <laughs> screen wonder that's on the wall. You really need to get serious about preparedness set a, a prioritized budget, free up resources by selling off your frippery. You can sell your collection of Hummels. You can sell your guns in oddball calibers. You can sell your collection of uh, this or that. That will give you the money that you need to buy some pretty important gear that may end up saving your life. And, and to echo that, you know, I, I took your warnings to heart um, and I, I just told you about the garage sale. I made $8,000 over the course of five days selling off a bunch of stuff that was sitting around my garage um, that I didn't realize I had that much stuff sitting there. Um, but you're right, you know, there's it is time to give up some of that stuff. Uh, I sold my, yeah, sold get my rid motorcycle. Yeah, but save the stuff that will be useful barter items. Yes, well, which like a Game Boy and uh, a Sega Genesis, probably not so much. Right. <laughs> uh, let's see. We've got about 15 minutes left here. Um, one of the things that I have been astonished with, and I think this goes especially now across the board, it doesn't matter what political realm people are coming from, our presidential leadership has been quite honestly mocked by the world and Recently, Putin kept us out of World War III, uh, where our, our administration was trying to make us go down this, this warmongering route, um, which inevitably is going to continue the dive of our dollar. We're going to lose more, uh, more of our friends and family members to war that, quite honestly, we, <laughs> we probably shouldn't be at. Um, and because of all of these things and the exposés of all these scandals, I had recently read an article about... American citizenship being renounced more now than ever in history, it, mm -hmm. like up 200%. Um, I mean, have you heard this type of thing? Oh, yes. I, I, and I hear it from consulting clients and my readers all the time that they're, they're thinking about 
expatriating. In fact, the, the, the title of my, my next novel is Expatriates. Um, the, the problem with expatriation is that unless you have very deep contacts in your host country where you're going to move, you're probably going to be seen as the expendable new guy if everything hits the fan. It's yeah. not a very enviable position. So unless if you're moving to a to a lang, to, uh, to a country that speaks a language other than Engl- English, it's really important that you speak the language fluently. And it's regardless of where you move, it's very important that you have family contacts in that country. The um, so if you're marrying into a family, that might be a good approach. If you already have relatives in that country that are well established, that might be viable. But otherwise, I really don't see it as a viable approach. I think the best place to be, again, is in the American readout. Uh, everyone should have a plan B. I, I think that if someone is fairly wealthy, they should probably have an offshore bank account and an offshore safe deposit box. And if they can arrange it, a second passport. Because a plan B is always really important. But plan A should probably be right here in the United States for most of us. It's, it's interesting you mentioned expatriating because when I was working on cruise ships, uh, I had seriously, seriously looked into it. Um, you know, and, and the reason I say when I was working on ships is because I saw the tax structure. Um, mm-hmm. I would spend, and this is no shock to most people, but I would spend more than 50% of the money I earned on cruise ships paying our government, a tax, a penalty. But the reality was I didn't make a penny of that in the United States. I was overseas for all of this. Right. And so unless you renounced your U.S. citizenship, you'd still be subject to the tax. Well, thankfully, you know, something like over $100,000 a year, the, the first 100000 you make um, is only taxable in your host country under U.S. law. But there's nothing to say they might not change that in the long term. So uh, if you have a second passport, then you can always flip the switch and uh, take the the one-time tax bite and bail out of the country. But you have to have that passport. Uh, I recommend for anyone of Irish ancestry, all it takes is one grandparent who's born in Ireland to qualify you for for an Irish passport. And Ireland is part of the EU, so that gives you residency in any EU country. Oh, That's wow. a very valuable thing. And even if, if your great-grandfather was born in Ireland, say, you, you could have one of your parents, uh, go, uh, your parent that's related, get Irish citizenship. And then a couple of years later, you can get Irish citizenship and an Irish passport. Officially, the United States does not recognize dual citizenship. Unofficially, it's very widespread. And I know lots of people that have an Israeli passport, that have an Irish passport, that have a Croatian passport. It, it can be done, and I do recommend it. It's always wise to have a plan B. How do you see Canada playing into this? Because I've got some relatives that have dual, you know, quote-unquote, air fingers here, dual citizenship to Canada. Um, yeah, unfortunately, uh, Canada is great in that it has a very low population density and most people are on hydropower. That's great. The bad news is it has even more deeply entrenched socialist government than we have, and they have really sucky gun laws. So <laughs> I, I generally don't recommend Canada, but if someone is, uh, has Canadian connections, uh, there's nothing to say that you shouldn't get a Canadian passport and then be able to travel with it, because there may come a time within the next five or ten years that carrying an American passport might be a death sentence in yeah. some countries. If you're Canadian, you're essentially neutral. There's been so times it, where I've been... It's, it's wise to at least get a second passport in Canada, but as far as building a survival retreat in Canada, I wouldn't recommend it. Very very well said. You know, and there's been times, too, where I've been traveling overseas where, uh, you know, and actually one story, a guy that I toured with had a, uh, a Canadian $2 coin in his pocket when he got mugged. And the guy saw saw the Canadian coin. He said, you're Canadian? And my friend was like, yeah. And the guy's like, oh, man, I'm sorry. 
and he stopped. <laughs> I kid you not. He stopped the beating because he thought this guy was Canadian. And so, you know, going overseas, it's it's just always been in the back of my mind to carry some some Canadian currency in my wallet just for, for the day I'm on the bus getting mugged by someone who thought I was American. Um, yeah, uh, back in the mid 1980s, there was a very highly publicized airline hijacking, and the the terrorists who had taken over the airliner started collecting everyone's passports. Well, a couple of the guys on the planes plane didn't have passports. All I had, all they had, was their American military IDs and the, and a copy of their orders, which is all that you really are required to carry when you're traveling overseas. Well, guess who got dumped out on you know whose bodies got dumped out on the tarmac first? Uh, yeah. Americans. So um, and followed by a couple of people with American passports. So it's important that people keep their options open. Plan A, Plan B, Plan C, but Unfortunately, a lot of people fall into the trap of developing almost a mental fantasy about living offshore. They have this idealized idea of what, of, of what it's going to be like without, in some cases, ever even having been there. And they, they gear all their preparedness into, you know, jumping on some sailboat or something. Uh, you really don't want to be caught in fantasy land. Be realistic about things work within your budget and be practical. Great advice. I've, I've have a question here. Then I want to talk about your new book for a moment. Um, but before we, we jump on that, as I was reading Patriots, um, I, and again, this is my fa- all time favorite book ever, hands down. Um, I couldn't help but wonder if you had structured one of the characters in the book around you. Have Actually, you based... no, I, not, not that much. Uh, the Todd Gray character is a little bit like me in terms of personality, but I've never worked as an accountant. <laughs> uh, most of the other characters, though, are based on real-life friends of mine who I've known, with, known and, and worked with and um, in some cases trained with for decades. In a few cases, they're actually uh, combinations of people became a character. But uh, there really is a Dan Fong, and there really is a Jeff Trussell. They just have different names. <laughs> Very cool. I, I, I've wanted to ask you that since the day I read the book. So glad I got that one out of the way. Uh, so, so talk to me about your new book. What, what's it about? What can people expect? And, and if they haven't sure. read any of your books before, why this one? Okay, well, uh, like my other novels, it's set in a near-future socioeconomic collapse that's global. It's all triggered by a debt default in the United States and a collapse of the U.S. dollar and the collapse of the U.S. stock market, which leads to full-scale anarchy, basically. Uh, This novel is a little bit of a departure from my others in that there's no crossover characters with the other books. So even though each book was designed to stand alone, this one is tremendously standalone. You could you could pick it up without having read any of my books and you could jump right into it with no problem. This one is set overseas. The main characters are American expatriates. There's a missionary family uh, originally from the Northeast who are living in the Philippines. And there's a young Texas oil engineer living in in the Northern Territory of Australia and in the city of, or right near the city of Darwin. And those, those are the main characters. There's also a, another storyline which takes place in central Florida, uh, with not too far from Disney world. Uh, the, uh, the character there is the sister of the, uh, the wife in the missionary family in the Philippines. I wanted to show the collapse from, from the perspective of those three families to illustrate the uncertainty of living overseas and being out of communication, out of contact with everyone that you hold dear and Mm. just how stressful that would be. If we're in an economic collapse and, and uh, the phone lines are down, the internet is down and even all the uh, major uh, shortwave stations drop off the air, we're going to be in an information vacuum. No one's going to know what's going on. It's good, and the anxiety level is going to be really high. That same premise applies to someone living in the United States who's hunkered down at a retreat 
not knowing what's going on with their family members only a couple hundred miles away. They might as well be on Mars for all you know uh, because you're completely out of touch. And the anxiety level that that's going to bring is is going to be tremendous. And that's one of the things I wanted to illustrate in the novel. I also wanted to illustrate the importance of the American nuclear umbrella. And if it were ever folded up and put away, which would happen if uh, we had a full-scale socioeconomic collapse and government collapse here in the States, all the countries that have been dependent upon American military power are suddenly going to be on their own. So in in this novel, I illustrated... Uh, Indonesia de- developing uh, both a, a radical Islam government and new territorial aspirations where they mm. would first take over uh, East Timor and the Philippines and then Papua New Guinea and then eventually try to take over Australia. So it makes for a pretty exciting story. Uh, I hope your listeners enjoy reading it. But again, even for their listeners that have no interest in fiction, please at least take full advantage of all the resources at my website. They're all free. Again, it's survivalblog.com. Yeah, and the the website's been a fantastic resource. And uh, and, in your books, I mean, honestly, I I, I feel like I'm beating it to death here. I'm not making a commission on this, I swear. (laughs) But, uh, But some of the best books ever, especially on the topic, if you like it, there's you know, there's been other authors we've interviewed, and they have some good books, but this is um, yours are by far the the best in the in the industry for sure. And the one thing that you didn't mention here that I've heard you mention on, on other interviews is the timeline of all of your books and how they yeah, all take all, place. All the novels are set with the same timeline, with some with uh, uh, a very rapidly unfolding socioeconomic collapse where all it takes is a few words spoken, confidence in the U.S. dollar evaporates, and very quickly the value of the dollar plunges in international exchange, the American stock market tanks, and things fall apart very quickly. Uh, Once the economy falls apart, rioting and looting start almost immediately in the major cities. And at that point, public utility employees don't feel safe going to work. So the power grid collapses. And uh, one fact that's not very well known is that under the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's rules, nuclear power plants cannot operate below a certain level of staffing. If they don't have a full shift of people to run the power plant, by law, they have to shut that power plant down. That's one of the things that could could trigger a grid collapse, particularly in the eastern United States. Wow. Well, better that they shut it down versus getting a Fukushima, you know, which well, yeah, although, is one of my greater although fears here. Although if the grid collapses and they're not producing their own power, uh, they're in deep trouble because uh, the even though the, the power plants themselves have wonderful containment, they have these elaborately built containment vessels, the spent fuel ponds that they have just have a tin roof over the top. (laughs) And um, either they're producing their own power to circulate the water through those cooling ponds, or they're using grid power to to run the circulating pumps. If that power disappears, then very quickly the water in those cooling ponds is going to heat up, hit a boil, and then boil off, and then you're going to have spent nuclear fuel rods in the open air and you could have some serious repercussions. Wow. Well, with about two to three minutes left here, uh, what, and this is a tricky question to kind of answer because it's a time frame type thing, but I guess what does the collapse look like? You know, what are the, what are the warning signs that could tell people it's coming and then how well, quickly we're seeing the warning, we're seeing the warning signs right now. Um, there's already rumblings about a, a rise in interest rates. And the way that the American government has structured our debt and the way that so many derivatives have been written, just a 2% rise in interest rates in the course of a couple of weeks could bring the whole house of cards down. Oh, geez. The, um, most of the derivatives that have been written have been written with the assumption 
that there's going to be a movement of only a few basis points, you know, a, a few hundredths of uh, a percent of interest rate change. That's where all the all the gambling is going on right now. They're not structured for huge swings in interest rates, and if they do happen, the derivatives traders are going to get clobbered. And as we've seen with the, with the 2008 crisis, the lender of last resort is going to be the U.S. government, which means indirectly the American taxpayer. Jeez, do you do you have a thought process of of a time frame where uh, it's you know you see let's say you see the two percent interest rise. How long do you think that America has before it goes from interest rates to anarchy on the street? A month? Uh, probably within a couple of weeks. Yeah. If we see a spike in interest rates and there, and there starts to be talk about a, um, a default on American obligations, then we could see a, a collapse within a couple of weeks. We could, it could ha- happen that quickly. Jeez. Well, well, Jim, I sure appreciate your time. Um, any, any last closing thoughts you have before we wrap up the show? No, I'd, I'd just like to say that I appreciate you, your show, your efforts, and I pray Psalm 91 for all your, all your listeners. Uh, it's time to team up, train up, and hunker down. Well, I, I sure appreciate your time. And again, the book is Expatriates. It's available on Amazon. You can get it through Kindle. Is there any other location you'd like to send people to buy the book? Oh, it's uh, the uh, the books. Uh, well, go on sale October first. Please wait until then to order to get the very best price. And it's going to be available at all major bookstores through Amazon.com, Borders.com, uh, through ChristianBook.com. It, it's going to be just about everywhere. So it, it'll be very widely available. Well, let's let's book bomb this. Let's all buy this tomorrow at uh, at nine a.m. Uh, October first to be able to. Purchase this, get it, read it, share it, uh, and and prepare, guys. Uh, Jim, if you can stay on the line one second, I wanted to get a, send some information your way here. But uh, guys, thank you so much for listening to the show. My name is Dave Womack. Coming up, uh, keep listening to all the shows here on Prepper Broadcasting Network. Uh, it's we're all just trying to help everybody out and help make the world more prepared. We'll see you next week, Monday, 4 p.m. in the West, 7 p.m. in the East. I'm Dave Womack. Thanks for listening.